I'm uh, one of the co-owners of Together Studios. Uh, we've made a number of games, including Illimat, and uh, we're currently working on the Adventure Zone game. Both of those are things you can try out in the, uh, the hall. Uh, I also made the role-playing game Phoenix Dawn Command uh, and card game Gloom. Um, Eberron is something I've worked in role-playing games for around 20 years at this point. And in 2004, Wizards of the Coast uh, acquired Dungeons & Dragons from TSR, created the third edition, and while they had all of the existing settings that they inherited from TSR, they wanted to make something that was new for third edition. So they actually did an open call uh, saying, send us your idea for D&D World, and they got 12,000 submissions. Long story short, went through a long process, they ended up choosing Eberron. Uh, so Eberron came out for third edition and was designed with third edition in mind. Uh, the, it's built on a couple of sort of core principles. Uh, the first was this idea, the one sentence we used to describe it was Lord of the Rings meets Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Maltese Falcon. Uh, that it was taking both the idea of over-the-top pulp adventure, but then also encompassing uh, more shades of gray, film noir uh, sort of intrigue. And it was wanting to sort of twist a number of the traditions of D&D of the time, having stories that were not so clear-cut, where it's not always clear. One of the things we said is, the villains aren't always monsters, and the monsters aren't always villains. Um, it was always designed from the start to be broad. Sometimes it's called pulp noir because of those two elements, but that doesn't mean that every game has to include both of those. It's saying from the start, do you want a crazy swashbuckling adventure where you're roaming through the jungles of Zendrick looking uh, for an ancient artifact, or do you want a story that's on the mean streets of Sharn where you know uh, you know, you have no idea who the good guy is in this situation, and it's always going to end bad, because it's always raining in Sharn. Uh, a second aspect of what defined the world, so first we had this element of pulp adventure, more intrigue, but the other thing for me was coming to the fact that magic in Dungeons & Dragons behaves in a very scientific manner. There's nothing mysterious about the magic of a wizard. It is reliable. You know these specific spells. You can cast them three times a day, and they always work unless you're punched in the face while you're casting it. You can train, you know, if you trade spell books with another wizard, you can learn their spells. You know, this isn't sort of weird, obscure, uh, mysterious. It works in a very practical, reliable, scientific manner. Uh, third edition in particular had very concrete rules for creating magic items or creating new spells. What bothered me was that a lot of settings essentially following the mold of Lord of the Rings presented wizards and magic users as very much they're off in an ivory tower, sort of beings of mystery, which makes sense in Lord of the Rings where wizard is actually a race. You don't choose to become a wizard. You are a wizard. But in D&D, that's not how it works. It is something that is skill-driven, that is reliable, that you can train in. And so for me, that always hit the point of why isn't that incorporated into society the way that science is incorporated into ours? That over the course of centuries, if you had access to these kind of magical tools, why don't we see those being used for communication, for transportation, you know? And so Eberron was drawing on the sort of idea of if we had arcane magic like we have in D&D in the Renaissance, instead of the science we use, what does the world look like 300 years later? So it is a world where magic is integrated into the core civilizations, where people do use it uh, as, you know, for weapons, for communications, for things like that. Uh, initially, the first draft I did of it was very much a sort of 1930s, 1940s, you know, Rages of the Lost Ark feel. Ultimately, we decided we wanted to scale it back a little because if everybody is running around with wands instead of bows and things, it starts to feel less like D&D. So from a sort of technological level, it's a little more around sort of the late 
uh, 19th century, sort of 1890s. We have the lightning rail, which is essentially a railroad. We have sending stones, which, or speaking stones, uh, which essentially function like a telegraph. So, you know, there's no phones, there's no radio, but there is a way to send a message across the country point to point. Uh, people have just started in the last war. Uh, you have wand slingers who essentially use wands instead of bows or crossbows, but that's still something that requires a certain amount of training. It's a relatively new development. Air travel as well with airships are something that has only happened over the last 10 years. We basically wanted that idea that, again, part of science is the idea that it evolves, that you're in the world, magic is part of the world, but it feels dynamic like, again, air travel's just, we're just figuring that out. 10 years from now, it's going to be more commonplace. 10 years from now, we might not use crossbows anymore because we've got everyone's using a wand. Uh, but right now, it's still that sense of it's part of the world, but there's still room to grow. Um, any questions about any of that before we go on? All right. Uh, so you had those core principles from the start. Pulp adventure, more intrigue, magic is part of everyday life. Uh, we also wanted stories that felt both like you know, having touchstones in our world, things that we can relate to, even though they are unique. Uh, one of the main things that ties to this is the idea of the last war. So within Eberron, the primary continent of Corvair is, is the continent where people usually start. And 100 years ago, it was largely united under the kingdom of Galifar. But around 100 years ago, Galifar collapsed into civil war. And the world has gone through a century of war uh, that has risen and you know, ebbed in its uh, intensity, uh, but that has only come to an end four years ago in an event called the Morning, which completely destroyed one of the central nations uh, of the continent, transforming it into a horrible magical wasteland. So it's a little bit of a sort of Nagasaki-Hiroshima event, except nobody knows why it happened. Nobody knows if this was a weapon someone developed that misfired, if it was a consequence of too much war magic being used. Uh, but basically, this happened. It could happen again. So that called a sudden end to the war. No one won the war. The nation of Seir, uh, which was destroyed, lost the war, for sure. But what it means is that within the setting, you are in the shadow of this terrible conflict that has gone on for longer than most characters' lives and that wasn't really resolved to anyone's satisfaction. And you also have the looming mystery of the morning, the cataclysm that destroys here, with the could this happen again? Could, if any nation could harness that power, could you know they be unstoppable? How are you going to deal with that? Part of why that's important is because in making characters, it immediately gives you the question of what did you do during the war? That there was this bitter war that covered the entire continent. If you're a fighter, the war was only four years ago and it only came officially to an end two years ago. What did you do? Who did you fight for? Uh, if you didn't fight for one of the nations, why didn't you? You know, were you working as an enforcer for a criminal organization? Were you a mercenary? Uh, and so it gives a lot of room to start off with of how did the war affect you? Were you part of it? If not, why not? And what did you do instead? Did you lose anything? Uh, you know, for example, Sirens uh, is another easy adventurer thing of you lost your home, now what are you trying to do from there? And that's a matter of it's something that we can all reflect on, whether you're looking at uh, World War I or World War II, impact of nuclear war in the Cold War, uh, events you know, in the Middle East, you know, that we understand the impact of these things. And so this was just trying to bring that in and say, we're not just talking about knights and dragons and princesses. We're talking about what do we do with all these Syrian refugees? We're talking about, uh, you know, again, the concerns between the balance of power of nations. Um, a final twist that adds into that, again, reflecting life in our world, is the dragon-marked houses. That there are 
uh, 13 organizations where the members have essentially inherited magical power. Uh, these things called dragon marks that basically manifest, grant the people who have them uh, magical abilities and are transferred down family lines. Over the course of centuries, the families that have these powers have essentially established guilds that dominate different parts of the magical economy. House Jurasco controls the healing trade. House Zivis controls communication, managing the speaking stones that we talked about. Lirindar uh, covers the airships. And so part of that is saying a lot of these everyday magical tools are in the hands of these guilds that wield monopolistic power. If you want to deal with, you know, if you're going to be on an airship, you got to have a Lirindar pilot. And part of the idea there is that with the collapse of the United Kingdom into civil war, there is now the question of if these dragon mark houses basically have more power than the nations at this point. And it is very much something that you can just play down and just say, well, this is the guy who flies your airship, but you can also explore and say, do you want that to be part of your story? Do you want, you know, that the, uh, the houses can to some degree play the same role as mega corporations in a cyberpunk game? where you know they are these sort of out of control economic powerhouses or you know again as i said you can downplay that but part of it is you can play a dragon marked character that gives you a connection and it then becomes are you a proud member of your house are you helping them with their agenda or are you someone who's rebelled against the house structure and you're trying to do your own thing um, one other thing that differentiates Eberron particularly from the, for, uh, the Forgotten Realms uh, and more classic fantasy is the, um, that gods do not concretely manifest in the world. In traditional D&D, back from early on with the first deities and demigods, it was presented in a very much Greek or Norse sort of model where gods show up, walk around, you can punch Thor in the face. And part of the thing about that is that it changes the role of faith, that you don't really need faith if, if the god's right over there and we can shake his hand. It becomes more like professional sports. It's not a question of do we believe in Thor. It's a question of are we on his team or not. Uh, Eberron, we basically said, we want this to be more reflective of our lives where clerics have power, but we don't absolutely know that that power is coming from gods because wizards have power, you know, science have power. Uh, but that clerical spellcasting ability comes from faith, but yet it is still about faith. And why that's important is because it means you can have things like heresies, you can have schisms, you can have a crusade that's fought for the wrong reasons because Thor is never going to come down and say that guy's right or you're, you know, you're doing a bad thing. So it comes back to the noir aspect of saying we want a world where you can have the church that is ostensibly the greatest force of light in the world still do something terrible because people occasionally make mistakes, you know. And so it is a setting in which there are, you know, fewer clear answers where sometimes, again, people who are technically good in alignment could be the villains in the story. Um, that is a basic overview. Again, any questions at this point? Or shall I just keep blathering? Now, part of where that came up is a question that came up earlier was the question of when coming up with a setting, how does that affect the mechanics of the game? Now, Eberron in particular worked in the reverse. It was with Eberron, I made it for this fantasy setting search 10 years ago, and part of the point was knowing this was a D&D setting. It was designed around that magic works like this in D&D, so this should have an impact. A lot of pieces of Eberron are basically saying, if this existed, how would it logically play out? I'll say that in particular, there is a nation in Eberron that is a nation of monsters uh, called Droam, and there the idea is it's a united nation of monsters, so their tool is an arcane magic. It's the abilities of monsters. If you had Medusas, if you had Harpies, you know, what could you do with those abilities as building blocks. One of the things I'll note there is that in order to feed the masses, because many of their people are carnivorous, 
uh, they actually make troll sausage because trolls regenerate. And so the idea is you have Soylent Troll, uh, that the, the daughters who run the nation, again, basically produce this, this stuff they call grist, uh, and that's part of their power. And how they do it is they have troll farms where they, you know, grist mills, where they just uh, produce endless amounts of troll sausage. Uh, but that's just an example of that kind of, if you had a troll and it can chop its arm off and grow a new one, what could you do with that? You know, and that's the kind of question we're asking. Now, flipping gears a little and just talking more generally about world design and setting design, part of that question, so in Eberron, the setting was designed around the mechanics of D&D. I also made a game called Phoenix Dawn Command, which was a role-playing game we built from scratch, and the twist to Phoenix is it's fantasy role-playing. I like to say it's sort of if you took Rome, the TV series, and mashed it up with Aliens and uh, Pacific Rim. It is a fantasy game, but is a world that is beset by a host of uh, supernatural threats. It's getting worse. We don't know why. The twist to Phoenix was always the idea that death is how your character improves that when you die, you come back stronger. But you don't come back right away. You don't come back where you died. So in the course of an adventure, death is significant. You might fail your mission if we all die, but it's not the end. Uh, but you can only come back seven times. And uh, the point there was with that as our core idea. You know, we love this idea that we want a game that gives you moments like Gandalf on the Bridge and Moria where we want to say that it is a valid thing to say we cannot beat this Balrog, it is going to kill us all, but wait, I could take down the bridge even if I go down with it. And that's not a kind of story you're generally going to tell in D&D, where death is essentially failure, and where further you have a relatively limited control of things. So that was a point where when we decided this is a game where we want death and sacrifice to be a core part of it, we knew we needed the world to be built around that. People have said to me, could I play Phoenix in Eberron? I'm like, well, you could, but that world isn't designed to tell that story. Phoenix, we specifically created the world where it is facing an existential threat people don't understand that normal people cannot fight and that the stories will be, we're in this village, there's a zombie outbreak, you have two hours to contain it, and if you fail, by the time you come back, we're going to have lost the region. It will have been overrun. And so you need that point where we're saying there is something worth dying for. Even if the whole party has to go, if we can end this before you know, we run out of the deadline, that's worth it. And that's very different from I'm going into this dungeon because I want to make 500 gold pieces and get a magic sword. And so that sort of comes to that point of first, the setting needed to present the stakes as being high enough. And then the mechanics of the game, Phoenix is a game where... Uh, it uses cards instead of dice, and part of the drive of that is we wanted to give the players more narrative control. The dice are random, and uh, what I hate in D&D is when you get the moment where it's the finale, you've gotten to the big villain, you give your big, you kill my father speech, you use your, uh, you know, your biggest attack, and you roll the one, and you're just like, ah, dang it, you know, that was not how this was going to play out in the movie. Uh, with Phoenix, because you're using cards instead of dice, it's equivalently saying you roll your dice ahead of time, you know these are the rolls you have to work with, what can you do with them? So you may very well have a hand that is not going to let you uh, defeat the big villain, but you at least know I'm not going to make my big speech right now because I don't have the cards to back it up. You know, so there is less wasted effort, even if you can't do what you want. Phoenix also, though, has a mechanic that lets you essentially, you have a pool of energy that you can use to push beyond your limits, but when you run out of that energy, you die. So it again comes back to the point of the mechanics encourage players to basically say, you can buy success here if it's worth it. Is this the time? And so that's just an example of saying where we had both a setting concept and a core concept that we designed the world and the mechanics around that idea, the idea of a game driven by sacrifice, as opposed to Eberron, where it's the reverse of we said, well, we have these core mechanics, 
how do we make a world that sort of uses those in interesting ways. Anyone, any questions at this point about any of this, world design at all? Uh, what do people want to know? What, Phoenix? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm very proud of Phoenix. came out uh, about three years ago. We haven't done much with it recently because we're a two-person game company and because Eberron has now come back for fifth edition. So the last two years, I've really been focused on that. Uh, but Phoenix is, I do think it's a very interesting game that you tell just, it tells very different stories than I would tell when I'm running D&D because it is about that idea of when I make a D&D game, you know, when I'm doing an adventure, you want to feel like it's reasonably fair. Like there's about a 50-50 chance at least that you should be able to handle what you're facing. Phoenix is the reverse of, I like the reason I brought up aliens as an example, is a Phoenix adventure is usually about your people who are really good and tough and uh, good at what you do, but you're usually going into a situation where you know very little about what you're going to face, and the odds are not going to be in your favor. And it's about if you can pull this off, even if it takes you throwing yourself on the bomb or bringing the bridge down with you, you've got that sense of accomplishment of, oh, we managed... You know, to do this. And where usually it also means there's not a binary ending to an adventure. It is not simply we win or we lose. It's okay, we did manage to contain the zombies, but we did have to burn down half the village to do it, or half the party died in the process. Um, but as I said, whereas when I'm running an Eberron story, it's a different kind of story. And part of it is, am I trying to highlight uh, the pulp adventure aspect, in which case you want sort of chances for over the top. Uh, you know, what I've said in the book is, uh, you know, what's better than a scene on an airship that is crashing? A scene on an airship that's crashing and on fire! Because, you know, how can you take things up, you know, one more dramatic ten, uh, point? Um... Another thing I'll call out with Eberron that we do call out, tying to the noir aspect, is also encouraging people to really think about their characters. And this is the point of first off saying, well, let's take the war. How did it affect you? What did you do? Because that's a simple way to say, okay, you're a dwarf fighter. It's a good start, but who'd you fight for? Why'd you become a fighter? You know, what are you doing with those skills? Uh, with the noir example, we have a couple of things where we say either, well, what's something you regret? You know, everybody regrets something. Like, what's a mistake you made that haunts you? Or, uh, you know, someone you left behind? Or Because those things both give the character more of a sense of depth, but also give the game master. You say you've never forgiven yourself for leaving your uh, brother behind on the battlefield in this skirmish in Karnath. Well, maybe he survived, and now he's a death knight. And, you know, I mean, you know, that gives me things to work with. Uh, another thing we have in the book is a table that is, uh, why do you need 200 gold pieces? And it's just a way of starting out and saying, well, you might uh, have borrowed money from the Boromar clan. You might have an invitation to join the Orem if you could get 200 gold pieces in the next two weeks. You know, basically just saying, let's uh, throw something on the table that uh, just look into, you know, Star Wars A New Hope. The fact that Han has a price on his head is something that immediately makes it interesting and gives the players room to work, other than the fact that once he deals with Greedo, it never really comes up in the story again, other than that it's a driving point of motivation to him. So with Eberron, we do try and really say, like, think about your character, how they are part of the world, how things have affected them, that will vary based on whether you're, again, more in the pulp direction, more in the noir direction. Uh, another thing with that in mind that is unique to the Eberron book, and that this is the point with 5th edition, we were now, did have the opportunity to say, are we adding things to fit the world? And one of those is the idea of group patrons, where we basically say a group patron is like a background for your entire party. Uh, where when you're choosing a background, you're like, well, I am a fighter, but was I a soldier or was I a criminal? You know, and that changes your character. Uh, with a group patron, you can say, are we just freelance adventurers working for an adventurer's guild? 
Or are we agents of the Boilish Crown? Or are we Templars of the Church of the Silver Flame? Or are we hard-hitting investigative reporters for the Korenberg Chronicle? And that it is a way for the players from the start to say, we don't just want to randomly show up in a tavern and, I don't know, be going for money. We want to play a story where we're private investigators or where we're an elite military unit uh, you know, going on missions into enemy territory. You know, it's, it's just a way, to me, role-playing games, it's collaborative storytelling. What makes it more compelling than a movie, a book, is it's your story. It's the thing you want to make together. And so group patrons are a way for us to say, if we're about to make a movie, what kind of movie is it? You know, again, is it private investigation or is it a, you know, a gritty war story? And it just is a way to start that from the start, and then the book is full of different sort of hooks and different ideas of how characters would fit into that team. If you say we're doing investigative reporters, well, that doesn't mean you all have to be reporters. It means like maybe the bard is the reporter, the fighter is the, like, I'm the guy who's keeping you safe and out of trouble. Uh, the illusionist is like, oh, actually, I'm all about, like, you know, doing proper lighting and, you know, uh, such when we, when we phone things in. Um, anyhow, any questions about anything so far? That's the Star Command? Uh, Dawn Command, yes. Dawn Command, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's Phoenix Dawn Command. Uh, and again, part of the point of Phoenix is this idea that it is a world so contrasting to Eberron. Phoenix is a world where we said there's magic in the world, but it is not commonplace. It is not something, it is essentially something dangerous uh, that does not work scientifically and that has largely been suppressed by the empire that runs things. So again, it's fantasy, but at its base, more that idea of Rome. You know, that it's like this is a, a solid world, but now the dead are rising, uh, you know, there's uh, skin changers in the woods, there's a chant that causes everyone who hears it to go crazy and start killing people. All these things are happening and we don't know why. Uh, as a phoenix, you're someone who died and essentially fought your way back, you know, uh, came back imbued with supernatural power. Uh, but part of the point is that uh, first we're going to say, who were you? How did you die? You gained your power through that process. So you could have been an old man. You could have been a school teacher. You could have been a child. Uh, you know, so it's who were you? How did you die? What brought you back? Like, you know, what is it that you are fighting for? Um, and the classes in Phoenix, which are actually called schools, are essentially based on the lessons you learned sort of from your death. The Durant, which is somewhat like the fighter, is basically you died because you weren't tough enough. So you've come back tougher. Uh, the shrouded died because of secrets, either in pursuit of information or because of something they didn't know. And so they are more the sort of rogue investigator, uh, good at hiding, but also good at uncovering secrets. Uh, the devoted died for others. And you know they are, again, the sort of support uh, cleric sort of character. And as the game goes on, every time you do die, before you come back, as you're essentially leveling your character, part of the point is the game master and the player saying, well, what kind of death was that? You know, and that will determine, essentially, what lessons you gain going forward. Uh, so your first death always is the core definition. You know, if you are a Durant in your first death, you're always going to be a Durant. That affects your core abilities. But you could be a Durant with a bunch of devoted lessons will be very different from a Durant with a bunch of bitter lessons. Um, and so that's one of the things we like there is by the time you get to your fifth life, your abilities really reflect the choices that you made and the sacrifices that you made. The twist on it, of course, is that you do only get to come back seven times. So each time you die, you are essentially leveling up. You know, we want to pair the worst thing that happens in an RPG with the best thing. Uh, you get more powerful, but the more power you have, the more you have to be careful uh, with how you use it, because each death suddenly is worth more. On your first death, you got no reason not to throw yourself on that bomb. On your fifth death, well, you know, you don't have that many left to go. Uh, that brings up my question of uh, in, uh, Phoenix Dawn Command. Do you know how many times you can die? Yes. Oh. Now, it is <laughs> part of the theory of it is that seven is the most you can come back. 
But again, you don't come back unless you have something to fight for. So again, every time you died, we would stop. You know, between adventures, we'd say, what was your experience this time in the Crucible? What's the lessons that you learned? Uh, you know, and we talk about that. So in theory, a phoenix could only come back five times. In practice, players know that they get, they get seven you know, shots at this. But it is the case that you don't just want to waste it and say, I'm just going to walk in front of a truck because I want to get a new level. Because again, in Phoenix, with the odds being the way they are, you usually don't want to just throw away a life. <laughs> you know, you want to make sure you have everything uh, that you can. Hmm? No, no, definitely not. So. Well, well, and also it is definitely the case that, that we do say that is the point of, well, what was your lesson? And if you didn't get a lesson, uh, one of the schools is bitter. And the bitter is you died as a failure. And so pretty much, uh, yeah, you, you just have in front of a truck, that's a bitter death. You know, that's what you're getting. Um, hmm? Say again? Yes. So when you die, your spirit goes to a place called the Crucible. It's essentially your own personal training montage. So each phoenix has their own crucible. Uh, you have a mentor who is the spirit of a previous phoenix of your school. Uh, but that's just essentially, that's all about you and the game master. And part of the point is you can just say, oh, I just did this. Here's my lesson. Here's that. Or I will often, when I'm running it with my friends, again, between adventures, we just talk it out. You know, what is it? And part of it is maybe the mentor has something to share. Maybe they have, uh, we talk with the Shrouded in particular, where they're the secrets uh, folk. The idea that uh, a Shrouded mentor is kind of like a spy master. And they may be like giving you secret missions that, you know, the rest of the group doesn't know about or you don't even really understand why you're doing this thing that they told you to do. Uh, but it's basically you have dead Yoda in your head uh, who's going to help you out uh, between lives. And part of it is with Phoenix, it combines sort of high-intensity action because we want the uh, dramatic tension, we want the clear risk of death, uh, but it also combines that with investigation of the underlying premise is all these terrible things are going on. They're happening in increasing frequency and across a wider area, uh, but we don't know why. We don't know how they relate. Does the chant have anything to do with the army of the dead? You know, why are these things happening? And so part of it is uh, stopping that out zombie outbreak is important. But if you can't actually figure out why did it happen in the first place, you're just putting out a fire with no idea why these fires keep happening. And that's where things like the Shrouded in particular come in of you don't want to just beat up the problem. You want to try and figure out why are these things happening? Can you actually fight this rather than just dealing with the symptoms of it. Um, I will just say, you know, speaking broadly uh, to, you know, so with world design in the first place, part of the things that come uh, to me are what is the story that we're trying to tell? You know, what are you trying to do with the world that you're creating? Uh, with Eberron, the answer to that from the beginning was we wanted it to be a very broad concept that could support many different stories. From the start, it was pulp and noir. You know, you could do war, you could do espionage, you could do traditional. I've been running a campaign for a while set in uh, a nation called Kabara that's got a sort of gold rush thing going on that is basically a Western in D&D. Uh, you know, it's just dead wood but with lizard folk and dragon shards instead of gold. Um, and, you know, wand slingers instead of guns. And so Eberron was designed with that flexibility that we needed room for any story. Phoenix is a narrower focus for the world where this is a supernatural war story. And that basically one of the things we say to characters, you know, is when you're making your character, remember that you would not be cast in this movie if you were not willing to fight the dread. So it's up to you to decide what your motivation is, but you need a motivation that is going to lead to and I'll fight, you know, fight these bad things uh, because that is the story the world is founded on. And when you have that more focused story, you know, looking to D&D &D settings, it's the equivalent of Eberron is very broad, Dragonlance is from the start saying the world is about this conflict. Likewise, Ravenloft is very much just coming right out of the gate and saying, this is a horror story. 
you don't come to Ravenloft if you want to play investigative reporters, you know, dealing with political intrigue. Uh, and so if you're creating a campaign or a world, part of that question to me is what is the story you're trying to tell and how does the world reflect and support uh, that story? Um, I had a secondary thought in there, but uh, Plum slips my mind. But tied to that, one of the things that I think just broadly is compelling about role-playing games, again, is the collaborative nature. This isn't just my story. This is our story. We are making something. I have an adventure. I don't know if it's the one I'm going to play tonight or not. We'll see. Uh, that I've run 59 times. And every time it's been different because it's got enough points of flexibility that every time the adventurers are going to go in a different direction or try something no one's tried before. So even though I've run it 59 times, I'm happy to run it a 60th because I want to see what is this group going to do. How are they going to handle it? Um, and so that's one thing that we call out a lot in Phoenix, but I use in uh, Eberron as well, is I always like to make sure I am asking the players questions, that I'm trying to draw them into things. In one of the earlier Phoenix adventures uh, I was playtesting, there's a scene where basically you have a forest that's been sort of twisted by evil. Uh, the players find the, the sacred grove. It's got a statue of you know, the forest guardian. And I say, oh, this is all wrong. There's, you know, there's corpses strewn around. Uh, the lips of the statue have been sewn shut. But there's one more thing about it that really feels wrong to you. What is it? Uh, say it again. How did they sew the lips together? It's a good question. They're sewed together with vines. We're not sure. It just seems to have gone through. The first time I ran it, the answer the person said is, it doesn't have any eyes. Its eyes are missing. And so I took that and said, great, anything that's corrupted by the evil spirit gouges out its eyes is the first thing it, it does. And so that was this creepy point going forward of, you know, now their friends gouge their eyes out and they have to, you know, fight them as a crazy zombie. Uh, but part of the point is, especially with horror, I don't know what you find creepy. And so giving the players, I would never have thought of, of, you know, this eye thing. But, oh, that guy thinks no eyes is creepy. And so being able to then work that into the story uh, was an important detail. In running an encounter with, say, a mob of zombies. Well, zombies are just bags of hit points, you know, and they're not very tough bags of hit points. That's not very interesting. But the first thing I will do in a big zombie encounter is to stop and say, okay, this is a group of villagers you see, you know, the old butcher, and he's missing uh, one arm, but he's still got his bloody cleaver. I'll, you know, describe a couple, but then I'll take each player and say, tell me about a zombie that catches your eye. Uh, you know, what do you see? Someone's going to say, oh, there's a kid dragging a bloody teddy bear. There's, you know, whatever. Uh, I remember one time I did that kind of thing, and they said, well, it's weird. There must have been a circus in town because there's a bunch of clowns, you know. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, okay. The point of that, as weird as that particularly is, uh, is that it means that it's not just me telling you something. Once the players are providing that level of detail, it means they are seeing it in their mind. And that's going to make it more compelling to them because they thought zombie clowns, and now, oh my goodness, that zombie clown is doing like a crazy somersault, uh, you know, to attack you, but really slowly. And, um, and so, again, I really like picking up on that collaborative point is asking players to add details, drawing them in, and so again, it is our story, not just uh, my story. Uh, one of the things I just posted on my website, which is keithbaker.com, uh, was in handling travel. I'll often do the same thing. You've gotta go across uh, a big dark forest. The good part of the adventure is on the other side of the forest, and I wanna get there. Uh, I don't want to waste time with fighting bears in the woods or whatever, you know, a bunch of bandits. I know you can handle bandits. It would just slow us down. Uh, but I do want you to feel like it was significant to get there, that you did have to go through this haunted forest, that it is creepy. And that is, again, where what I might do is just start by going around the table and say, okay, you know, halfling thief, there was a bunch of bandits. How did you get the party past the bandits? You know, and did you sneak by them? Do you have a friend among the bandits? Did you, you know, out, you know what did you do? Uh, you know, priest, you had a really disturbing dream, you know, in the middle of the, the forest. What was it, you know, when you camped that night? And all of these things are things that, first off, there's no chance of failure. 
You couldn't screw it up. I'm not saying how did those bandits kill you. I'm saying you got by them. What did you do? But that leaves opportunity. If you say, oh, it turned out the, the, the bandit uh, leader was an old friend of mine, maybe they'll turn up later. You know, maybe he'll end up coming and helping you. If you have the crazy dream about the such and such happening, I may try and grab some of those details and work them in. So it's basically a point of you don't have to have random encounters, for example, if you've got a good enough story that they're not adding anything to it. You know, if you're just trying to build a little color and time, engaging the players and getting them to add details to the world is a way to really get everybody more invested uh, in the story. Uh, at this point, we're past our halfway mark. So again, any questions? Yeah. Yes. So Eberron definitely has a fairly well-defined history, and uh, one of the things I haven't done as a book, but I've always wanted to do as a book, is basically a bunch of just little mini campaign guides to different part, you know, different. Uh, periods you could run a game in. The last war is something we do call out, like even in the book there's a section on if you wanted to run adventures set during the war. Uh, and in 3.5 there was a book called Forge of War that was really sort of all about uh, the war and dealing with it. But you also have things uh, about 160 years ago, the Church of the Silver Flame, the main sort of force of good church, uh, essentially had an inquisition against uh, lycanthropes and more or less wiped lycanthropes out of, uh, of the world. And what I'm always saying is people often say, oh, those poor werewolves. And I'm like, well, actually, no. I mean, the way lycanthropy works, it could technically have an exponential expansion, especially since uh, Eberron has 12 moons. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that basically, to me, this was less, oh, a cruel, this was less a Salem witch trial and more 28 days later in the jungle with werewolves instead of zombies. Like, and I have often wanted to do a one-shot that is just a bunch of shifters and a bunch of Templars thrown together in the middle of, you know, werewolf apocalypse uh, in the jungle. Uh, but, uh, so, I mean, there's all these possibilities of things like that. Uh, I don't think, you know, as I said, that's been on my list to do next time I make a one-shot, uh, but I haven't yet. Um, reacting to people saying, have you done Phoenix in Eberron? I actually threw out a scenario, which is in Eberron, before humanity came to the content, uh, continent of Corvair, it was dominated by the goblins. The goblins had a big advanced empire that was torn apart by an incursion from the Plane of Madness, essentially the event that brought things like mind flayers and beholders to the world. Uh, and so I've always said, well, if you want to run Phoenix in Eberron, run it then. You know, you're not humans, you're goblins. You know, you are goblin phoenixes trying to fight against this unnatural uh, wave of aberrations uh, from, you know, from Zoriad. Um, but that is what I like about Eberron, is you can run a Western, you can run a war story. You know, it is intentionally big enough. One of the things that's said about it is uh, if it's in D&D, &D, there's a place for it in Eberron. Now, the key to that, a lot of people hear that and say, so it's a kitchen sink with just all sorts of stuff crammed together. The key to it is it's not that it's in Eberron. It's there's a place for it. It's that if you want to add any particular race, thing, magic item, whatever, if I stop and think about it, I can come up with, well, that would be something you know, produced uh, during the war as a bioweapon, you know, or this would be something, uh, you know, you'd be from this part of the world. But basically, it's that it has that lot of room to say what kind of story do you want to tell and where would that story take place. Uh, but I've actually, what I've often done in starting a campaign is to actually start the game during the war and to tell the group, like, make yourselves, like, you're a squad working together in the war we're going to run the first two adventures during the war. So we get some of the everyone having to work together, have each other's back, all of that. And then we're going to say, OK, now it's four years later. What happened? How did we get here? You know, Because that gives the players a tight connection and potentially enemies you know, are such that they built. To me, it's a little of Firefly, of it's that idea of especially 
the best way to do that story, in my opinion, is to have them come from the nation of Seir, which has been destroyed. So it's that point of, we start off with you during the war, and now we go four years later and we say, wow, and your country is completely destroyed. What are you doing now? You know that you have that, we're sort of rootless, uh, homeless, trying to figure out. But on the other hand, we're a bunch of badasses. So what do we do? Um, yes? Uh, so our official answer to, uh, to pronunciation is that, oh, no, no, no. I, so what I'm saying is our official announce, uh, answer to pronunciation in Eberron is there is no one proper pronunciation, that it's like uh, tomato, tomato, you know, someone somewhere probably pronounces things the way that you say it. So I have been saying seer until probably a month ago. I usually would call that nation Siri. But it's problematic because every time I do, my phone uh, <laughs> starts doing something. Uh, but, you know, Seer, Siri, uh, Sire, you know, all of those are legitimate. So I say Weinarn, uh, but other people, you know, can say it another way. And, you know, so basically our thing is don't worry about, like, the proper way. Uh, the way you say it is proper somewhere. But, you know, if you say Siri, well, then you're clearly from, uh, you know, northern Siri, whereas what is now Valinar, they say Seer, you know, and that just tells us something about you. My DM tolerates Bard, but he never really has a good feeling for how magic works. Yep. come up with explanations, but have you heard of any really good ones or some ones? Well, I will say, on my website, I... uh, I have written sort of my, here's how I'd explore most of the classes. So if you say KeithBaker.com Bard in Google, I've got a whole article about like interesting things I would do with Bards. One of the points to me is I definitely, with any kind of character uh, class, what I'm going to do is look at the abilities and the mechanics and then say, okay, this is what the character does, how they do it is something that we can discuss for how it fits the story. So one of the things, I'm a big fan of bards that are not bards. Uh, A bard in Eberron is a very good model either for a spy or a wand slinger. You know that basically you are sort of, again, I'm a scoundrel, I'm a rogue, you know, I've got uh, uh, good social skills and I know how to handle the wand, you know, as long as I've got a couple offensive cantrips up my thing and I don't have to be like saying, oh, and I'm singing as I'm doing it. I'm just saying, oh, I'm basically just using arcane magic like a wizard uh, or a sorcerer. I just know a couple tricks, you know. Um, and even there, you could say inspiration. Now, inspiration could be presented, you know, the fact of the matter is you could say it's all about inspiring song, but the, fa- the practical element of it is I can give you a bonus if you can hear me. And so that could easily be like, I'm just really observant, and I'm just, like, pointing out, hey, that guy, you know, uh, he's limping. Quick, hit him on his left side. You know, or uh, I can't even remember some of the other ones that we've thrown out. But basically, anything that we can justify is I'm able to give you an advantage uh, through what I'm doing. Um, and, and so definitely, but on the other hand, going back to the different kind of group patrons. You know, Bard's definitely the reporter in the investigative reporter, but, you know, could just as easily be, I'm a private investigator. You know, again, I've got good social skills. I'm good at spotting things and telling people things that'll help them out. Uh, And I have a little bit of magic, you know, uh, to back me up. Um, So, uh, so yeah, and it's the same way that with something like a sorcerer, it's the same thing of, well, we know you have these or similar abilities, uh, but is it because you're a wand slinger who was trained in combat magic for the war? Is it because it's actually part of an aberrant dragon mark that you've developed, and that's where your spells are actually coming from? Uh, you know, there's no reason that you have to hold to the traditional concept of what a sorcerer is, as long as what we're focusing on is how do you do what a sorcerer does. Um... And even with going back to the bard as a spy, you know, part of it is you can even flavor your magic as actually your magic is less I know spells the same way. And it's actually like spy gadgets that, you know, Q Division has given you this, you know, glitter dust that uh, you know how to use to do things. And so there's a lot of ways that you can sort of play around with what is the, the idea of the character that you want and then 
how do you do that? Barbarians are another good example of, to me, there's lots of ways to play barbarians, not as barbarians. You know, rage is something that increases your defense, increases your damage, but there's nothing saying it has to be rage. Uh, one of my favorite characters is a warforged barbarian who's basically just the idea that when he enters rage, what he's really just doing is entering a enhanced battle mode, that he's just armoring up. And, you know, as long as he keeps that uh, adrenaline flowing, he maintains that state. But he's not at all barbaric, and he was actually manufactured, essentially, with this capability. What's next forever on? Uh, so what's next forever on? Excellent question. Uh, so we started with the Wayfinder's Guide two years ago on the DMs Guild, and that was basically trying out Eberron for 5th edition uh, to see if people liked it. People did like it, so we then got Rising from the Last War, which did you know, change and update a lot of the mechanics, and now, of course, that means it's official. Uh, I don't know what Wizards plans are uh, because I am just a freelancer. Uh, so, you know, they have the Adventure Path, the Oracle of War, uh, we're getting minis uh, in the next month or two, which I'm pretty excited about. There's a pretty sweet airship. Uh, so there's uh, there's random boxes, and there's uh, Gale Force Nine is actually doing a, a bunch of their sort of pre-primed minis that are pretty nice. Uh, and then there's a Sky Coach, which is a small airship uh, that's being made. Um, but. Uh, the main thing, so as I said, I don't know what Wizards is going to do, uh, and I think part of it is, again, because I think Wizards doesn't know what they're going to do. It's all about the response. The response to Eberron has been very strong, and so that may make them say, you know, maybe we should do more, because uh, it's definitely been, uh, I think, their best-selling book. Um, but there is a lot of content on the DMs Guild uh, that people are making. I am working on a book called Exploring Eberron, that has been somewhat delayed because I'm writing it all myself and it's basically the length of two novels, so I'm still working, but I'm hoping end of February, beginning of March. And part of that is that's going to be about a 200-page book that is covering a lot of aspects of Eberron that have never made their way into existing official books, more about the plains, more about the oceans, more about the role of magic in uh, on the battlefield. You know, just a lot of little... Uh, things where I've always liked that, and I've always been a little frustrated that it's never, they've never gotten uh, covered in detail. The name sounds a lot like the Explorer's Guide, but it sounds like the book is going to be completely different. Oh, completely different. So uh, it's, uh, as I said, to me it's just exploring places that we haven't really explored before. You know, as I said, the plains, Droem, Dargoon, uh, and then a lot of different, there is information about different classes, different uh, races, uh, religions, things like that. You had something? Um, do you ever run a campaign with a second warning in? No. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, what was your question? Somewhat off. Um, do you have any examples that you've seen of great world design or game design in other RPGs, other media? No, I think that's a great question. Design. I'm going to actually come back to yours first since it's about Eberron, so that way we're closing out Eberron and then changing the topic. <laughs> Uh, so the morning is the event that destroyed the nation of Seer in, uh, in Eberron. Uh, one of the things about it is we have never, we do not in the book actually give the answer of how it happened. Uh, because in part of it is we want, you know, I can play in your game and I don't know what caused the morning, even though I made the world. And we wanted that idea that there is no one answer. It is what you want it to be in your campaign. How does it affect, you know, how is it tied to the big bad guys you're going to use? How is it going to tie to things? So people have asked me quite often, uh, well, well, what is the answer? And the answer is there is no answer. I know six easy off the top of my head. It could have been this. It could have been that. Uh, but it doesn't need an answer until it needs an answer. To me, the morning is important because of its impact on the world, because it's why we have a Cold War, because we're afraid to go back to war until we have that answer. And so I've never actually even run a campaign where they have found the answer, because to me, I'm much more interested in the fallout than in solving the mystery, which would create a whole lot of other things. On the other hand, I've played in campaigns where people have, that's been part of the story. Um, so the idea of a second morning is certainly something that, again, could very much be part of it, especially if I was going to say that it's a weapon, that it's something that could be harnessed. And, you know, the Lord of Blades, House Kenneth, you know, someone has something that could cause that. 
uh, that's certainly a dramatic plot point. Well, we still don't know what's happening. Right, exactly. Or, you know, all people think they know what it is, and it turns out that's not at all what happened. Oh, no, and I like that. And I will say in one of my novels, uh, oh, the... the Right. Yeah, in one of my novels, in the, the Fading Dream, there is a presentation of this is what caused the morning, except that most of the other people in the book are like, nah, it's not what caused the morning, dude. No, you know, you're just nuts. Um, so back on, uh, you know, good world design, things that are very compelling, uh, that's a really good question. And it may be something where I'm going to have to think about this and write a blog post about it to really call out things that... Uh, I really enjoy. I'm trying to think of settings that I played in. I'll just flip it around and ask you for a start. What's a world that you really enjoy? In terms of worlds that I found most intriguing, mm -hmm. um, in terms of D&D, Planescape. Mm -hmm. Planescape, Planescape is certainly the first one that popped to my mind because Planescape is a world where it is just intriguing. It's mysterious. You know, There's questions to find out, and it does also take the existing planar structure of uh, D&D and do something very new and compelling with it. So I will say that I never played in pre-existing settings because I was always making my own stuff. Planescape was the one growing up that I was always, you know, I was always like, okay, but this I'm interested in. You know, this I want to, you know, steal ideas from. And Planescape Torment still to me is one of the best uh, computer D&D games out there. Um... I will say that I find things like Ravenloft, again, very interesting in terms of it does what it's trying to do, of saying this is horror D&D. Uh, at the same time, I've never actually, again, played a Ravenloft campaign, but I certainly see that I'm like, oh, if I wanted to do D&D and do horror, this does you know, a number of useful things that way. Uh, I've always enjoyed, I mean, I like the concept of Shadowrun. Uh, I will say that one of the core differences between Eberron and Shadowrun was from the start saying this is not a world that has magic and technology. This is a world where magic has taken the place of technology, where we are solving the same problems with magical answers. But I've always enjoyed the concept of, uh, of Shadowrun with just the blending of what happens when you drop a lot of magic into a cyberpunk uh, scenario. And, yeah? Oh, um, well, shoot. Um, I, I DM, um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I've never written my own. I always use pre-cons. Yep. And, um, one of the things I struggle with is that usually when I go to find a world to maybe make a creation, uh, a story in, I know all the things that already happened, so I'm like, I can't really do that because that happened in this right. book. Like, Forgotten now, Realms, I, so much has already happened in right. there that's kind of hard to... Now, I will say that was something we intentionally worked on with Eberron, where that's part of the point where we've left a lot of things. Like, we don't answer the morning because we want you to have the answer to the morning. Uh, it is a problem with things being too heavily defined, and one of the things when people are making worlds... One of the questions is, well, how much history should I put in? And my thing is always, as a standard rule, anything you're creating, if you're going to make a list of 100 kings, I want you to tell me three stories where that could matter. Like, why, am I, why is anyone going to care about your list of 100 kings? If it's because there's a lich king who's coming and trying to destroy the world, and to defeat him, we must know which of these kings was he. You know, now players have a reason to care about that and go into it. If you're just making it because, oh, it just seems interesting to have a list of 100 kings, then that's coming into what you're really creating is almost, again, this sort of roadblock uh, that's confusing. So it's always, to me, looking to lore as how does this build story? How does this give tools for people to use? Whereas just creating too much uh, you know, can be a problem in the other direction. I will also say that this was something in creating Eberron we did decide that uh, we didn't want a lot of powerful NPCs. We didn't want a Gandalf or an Elminster or something like that because we wanted this to be about your characters, like your characters should be the heroes. With There are 36 Eberron novels, but what we said is those are not canon. Those are things that could happen in Eberron, but they, by default, they have not happened. Uh, 
in one of my novels, the characters find an important artifact in the book Secrets of Zendrick, we give the stats for that artifact. We don't mention my party, because what we want is for you to find it. You know, if you're playing Lord of the Rings, we want you to be given the ring, not just to be in the world where the Fellowship did that cool thing. And uh, so first of all, what we do say with Eberron, but I say take this with anything you play, is with Eberron we say everything in the book is a starting point. It is a point of inspiration. But you should throw things out. You should change things. You know, you should not be limited. It shouldn't be you can't tell your story because that thing already happened. You should be able to say, yeah, well, in my Eberron that thing didn't happen. You know, or it's happening now. And that's the thing to me of the advantage of an established setting is it gives you something if you don't have time to make your own world, and it gives you something that other people can have some familiarity with. But you should always see it as a starting point that you can change or build on, never something that holds you back. One of the things just as a basic principle about world design is to me the whole question I, st I mentioned earlier on what is the story you're trying to tell? What is the, the sort of story that drives your world? But the other question that then ties to that, once you've answered that question, where are we going? The next question is how much of the world do you actually need to know about? With Eberron, because we said we want this to be any of these stories, we needed to know enough about the world to support a war story, to support an intrigue story, to support this. So we built it from the top down, started with the big map, worked our way in. On the other hand, if I'm just doing my Western in Kabara Dragon Shard Rush game, I could uh, potentially just know about this one town. You know, I'm just saying this is Deadwood. All I need to know about is Deadwood and the region within walking distance around it because that's all the players are going to get to. Uh, if you look at the series, this is back from the 80s, so you might not even know it, uh, there was a series called Thieves' World. Uh, that was a collaborative storytelling thing, and it was set in the city of Sanctuary. And essentially, beyond Sanctuary, we knew there was some kind of empire. We knew there was an order of wizards. But we didn't know names of all the countries. There wasn't a big map of the world, because it didn't matter. The city was as the universe as far as the world was concerned. Um, and, you know, basically, well, if players ever have a reason to leave or if suddenly a crusade shows up, well, now figure out what that church is that's doing the crusade. But you can iterate out. You can start with this is the core of the story and we're going to explore the world beyond it as we need because it's coming to us. So the, the final thing I'll say on that is so that's part of the point is in terms of intimidation of, oh, my God, creating a world – you don't have to create the whole world. You have to create enough of it that it supports the story you're trying to tell. And this is also a place where if you're not creating something commercially, you're creating something for your group. This is where, again, you can involve the players in the process. You want to play an elf ranger? Tell me about the elves. You know, what is their role? How, how common are they? You know, how do they interact? You know, you can, again, draw people in and say, well, you're the cleric. Tell me about your religion. Uh, and build things together. Would you liken it to like creating a video game level where you don't need to create the entirety of Raccoon City, you right. just need to create the street that your character is running on? Exactly right. And, and that's sort of the point is what is the story you're going to tell and how big does your world have to be to tell that story? So if I'm doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, I know from the start that part of our story is we're going to be traveling all over the globe, back and forth, going from exciting place to exciting place. For that, I need to know the shape of the world. But again, uh, one of the other campaigns I ran is essentially Gangs of New York. It's just set in a bad part of the city of Sharn. The players are all down and out and, you know, rough people basically dealing with a gang war going on in this part of town. And it's intentional to sort of the characters. Part of the question is why are you in this crappy part of town anyway? But it's basically saying we know the story is about this neighborhood. Like, you know, this is really all we're dealing with. Uh, and while meanwhile all the rest of Eberron is out there, I'm saying – Technically, I don't need the rest of Eberron as long as I really know this neighborhood. But what it means is I really know this neighborhood. I know the heads of all the gangs. I know the bar. You know, We've started out by saying, what's the bar that you guys always hang out in? And let's add details to that. And I'll add one last detail on that, which is to say it was actually the same thing with the Kabara campaign, the Western, 
which I've run a couple times. One of the things I started with there is by telling the players, the town needs a sheriff, it needs a preacher. Uh, if any of you want to take that on, if you want to say, well, your paladin is the sheriff, great. That's your job. If you don't, I'll make one, and now you're going to have to deal with them. You know? But basically, these are on the table. Uh, every game I've run someone, I think we had a game where we didn't have a preacher, but you know, people step in and have attachments. And then the first thing I did in session zero was say, I want each of you to tell me one person in the town who you have a, an interesting relationship with. You know, and everyone tell me something. Could be a relative, could be an enemy, could be something. But someone in the town that you uh, have a relationship with. Uh, and then we also said there's only one bar in town. Uh, each of you tell me one thing about it. It's called the Cat and Biscuit. The first game I ran, they said the, the bard starts off saying, oh, it's got an open mic night and really great acoustics. The next player says they make their own beer, and it's really good in the basement. I'm like, great. Third person says they make the best biscuits in town. I'm like, wonderful. Fourth player says they don't have a working toilet, and it stinks. And everyone else was like, why did you do that? Why did you just <laughs> literally crap on our uh, end? And, and so I'm like, well, the thing about it is that in Eberron, you have what are called cleansing stones that's essentially magical plumbing. And I'm like, well, you can get that fixed. It's going to be 200 gold pieces. Uh, and so for the next <laughs> three adventures, they were basically just trying to raise enough money. And I remember the, the sheriff at one point, third in, he's like, well, I know there's some kind of demon cult thing going on here, but I love that what we're concerned about is buying a toilet for the bar. <laughs> um, and so, like I said, part of that point is I knew the story. I knew, and there's this creepy crypt out on the outside of town. I knew that there's these lizard folk that are going to be causing trouble. But the players had this investment because they'd introduced a couple of NPCs, which I could then pick up and use. They'd, you know, really like it felt like their smelly bar now. And so I, rather than me making up every detail and just saying, here's my idea, be interested, by saying, you tell me part of this, it makes it all of our story. And to me, that's always in some way a way if you're going to be locked in a location. It's different, again, if you're traveling to a new place every adventure. But in this point with the Western, I want it to be about the town is essentially part of the story. And over the course of the campaign, we're going to build it up. It's going to be you know, attacked. It's going to be these things. You need the players to feel like in some way it's theirs as well. You know, to care about what happens to it. Uh, anyhow, I think we should probably wrap up because we should make sure the rooms, you know, they've got enough time to set up for next time. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming, and I hope to see some of you at seven tonight. Uh, otherwise, I'm also uh, in the hall uh, demoing various games, but also if you think of a question and you just want to come over and ask, please do. All right, thanks, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience-supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.